bit shorter than it normally is. So uh, we'll begin this morning with some announcements. Um, the women's exercise class meets here at 11 o'clock on Mondays. Um, we, it looks like we're resuming tea on Tuesdays. Are we doing that while the awards are out of town? Sure. Yes? Okay. Three o'clock. Um, in the conference room, just get together, chat, it doesn't have to be a girl, you, anybody can come, it's just a time for fellowship and um, a glass of tea or coffee or Dr. Pepper or whatever. Um, just really it's, a, it's an hour long uh, period for fellowship and just getting to know each other. Um, Thursday night is um, school music. We're doing school music at party? All right, wow. Yeah. And Oh, this is September. Oh, September. You're correct. So, so August. We're doing. Um, so the, the school, the tea is probably September as well. Yeah, I don't think tea's happening. It starts in September. Okay. Um, so Thursday night. What are we doing Thursday night? Uh, chosen. Oh, okay. So Thursday night we'll meet here at six for dinner, and then immediately following dinner we'll watch an episode of The Chosen. I don't know how many of you have watched that, but it's an incredibly well done um, depiction of the New Testament. Um, so if you'd like to join us, just let somebody know, um, and we'll let Sam know because um, he's in charge of that right now. Um, and then we meet again together on Sunday. Um, prayer time is at 940 in the chapel. Um, immediately following that is Sunday school, and then immediately following that is the worship service. Um, um, young Adult Bible Study resumes in September. Um, and if you have any questions about any of that stuff, um, just let Captain Sarah or uh, Captain Lori know, and um, you can be a part of any of the upcoming stuff. So, um, we're going to begin this morning with a chorus. We're going to sing it a cappella, um, um, and we're going to sing, um, yep, the song just went right out of my head. Um, I want your sports with praise. Yes, that one. I will. He has made me glad. That's the name of the chorus. I will enter his courts with thanksgiving in my I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made me. And I will rejoice in he has made me glad. So that's what we're going to say. If you know it, great. If not, three, we'll get there again. Three, three, seven. Oh, it's in the songbook? Yeah. 337 in the songbook. Look at that. Thanks, Sam. 337 in the songbook. There it is. All right. Number 337 in the songbook. We'll sing it through twice. And I have a deep voice, so I may start a little low, but you know, it is what it is. All right. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. Say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for He has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for He has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for He has made me glad. I will enter. Father, we're so thankful to be in your house this morning. We're so thankful to be in your presence. Lord, I hope that you will make our hearts glad and that you will open our hearts to your word as your speaker comes before us. 
Father, I ask for traveling mercies for those who are missing. I'm thinking of the Bull family and the Newman family and the Ward family this morning as they are all traveling. Lord, I hope that you give them a restful, peaceful, enjoyable time wherever they are, whatever they're doing, but that you would bring them home safely and that you would just refresh them and renew them and draw them closer to you so that we can be reunited as a family. Father, I ask that you be with each person who is here and those who are sick. I'm thinking of Major Duncan today as she is not feeling well and um, Mr. Walt as he is as, um, not with us today. Father, I ask that you would keep a hand on Brandon and Allie today, and that you would give them both peace as they continue this journey, um, and that you would be with the doctors as they continue to uh, provide him treatment in this, um, in this leukemia battle. Um, Father, we're grateful today for doctors and for their knowledge and for their using those skills and knowledge to help others. Father, I ask that we would do the same, that we would help others whether it's with a, a physical thing that they need or whether it's just being there and being present and sharing your love. Father, we ask all these things in your precious name. Amen. All right, so I'm going to ask Sam and Amy to come up. They're going to, we're going to sing a, cor a song called Cornerstone. The words of that will be on the screen. Um, and then we'll continue after that. So I'm taking care of Captain's dogs right now after away. And I actually into this so many times. So I was like, you know who Minnie reminds me of? And I said it was her. Because the way Minnie acts, sometimes just reminds me of Angel. But she gives the same face expression as a dog sometimes. <laughs> that is funny. <laughs> <laughs> But it's great because, like, you know, Minnie knows that I'm not her owner usually, right? But she she knows that I'm there to take care of her. So she's just, like, always coming up to me and making sure I don't leave you. But she doesn't want to be alone. And I was looking at that, like, kind of reminded me of God, actually. Because I was like, when was the last time that, you know, we were, like, being a dog and just... Going up to God every time, right? Like, me just comes up to me like any time that she wants, anytime she needs any attention, like you do. She always, <laughs> she always come to me, right? And she's like, just pet me. Oh, yeah. And I was like, you know, I never had that with God, and it's been a long time I had that with God too, where I'm going up to God and say, hey God, I have something to say, let's talk. And a few minutes later, going back to him again and just again. So as we sing Cornerstone, uh, in the verse, it just says, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and the righteousness. I dare not to trust the weak love, trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. So as we sing this song, I hope that your hope is built on nothing less and that Jesus was there when we had nothing in our life and when we were lost, he was still there for us. And he came here to save us from the sins that we were making and that we had no clue that we were doing.
We are weak. And we were strong because of Savior's love. And I hope that that is your prayer this morning. She hid him for three months. 
But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to the Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the waters. One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must not become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian where he sat down by the well. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and build the troughs to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away. But Moses got up and came to their rescue and watered their flock. When the girls returned to Raul, their father, he asked them, Why have you returned so early today? They answered, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. And where is he? Rehobo asked his daughters. Why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter Sephora to Moses in marriage. Sephora gave birth to his son, and Moses named him Gershom, saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. And God had his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Good morning. Good morning. In my defense, I'm just not purposely looking for a strip strap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, I'll, I'll give you an insight into my, my thought process when it comes to this. One thing is, is those of you where I am horrible about picking a direction. Like somebody could say, you know, just write a sentence, any sentence, and I'll sit there for 20 minutes trying to figure out what am I going to write about? I don't have any idea what I'm going to write about. And so, and I'm the same way with, with, with my sermons. I have no idea which way I'm going to go or what I'm going to do most of the time. And the, what I'm doing for the, for the next three weeks, I didn't decide on until last Sunday. And we were sitting in, 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 in church, and, um, and the captain, was, she was preaching, and she started talking about the number three, the importance of the number three. And then the first thing that goes on my mind is like, oh, I have three weeks of sermons. I should do something that's three parts. And I said, I should do something that's a person that has three parts. I should do Moses. That all took about four seconds. <laughs> and then I'm like, okay, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do Moses. I don't know where I'm going to go with it. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to do Moses. Because Moses is three parts. And that's how my mind usually works with these things. And so the, the, the Moses is broken. And his life is in three parts that are 40, 40 years each. And so today we're going to talk about first one. Um, so before we start, I'm going to ask you a question. Um, this will become important later. Uh, but so what I want you to do, it's like it's like those psychological tests where they give you a word, and you, you, whatever, whatever the first word is you think of. So we're talking about Moses. I want you to think of, think about Moses, what's the first word that comes to your mind when you think about Moses? It could be anything, doesn't matter. Any word. Any word that you think about Moses. Four. Don't tell me now. Don't tell me now. <laughs> Don't tell me now. Just think about Moses in one word, and we'll, we'll come back to that later. 
So, so background about what's, what's going on is, um, and it kind of alludes to it in the, in, in the second chapter. We're really talking the first, but we can move to the first chapter as well. Um, the Hebrew people have become a huge population in Egypt. A very, very large population with a very different culture from that of the Egyptians. And so the Egyptians were very worried that they, the Hebrews were going to rise up against them at some point. That somebody was going to bathe and the Hebrews were going to join them. So Pharaoh decided, well, I've got to deal with this. And so he wanted to curb the population of the Egyptians. And to do that, it's like uh, no, no males, no, no male children for how many every year he thinks it's going to take. Um, to reduce the population and make the population weaker. Um, and so he tried a couple different attacks and it didn't work. Um, and so finally got to, to where any any child, the male child of the age of two, just killed. Just kind of like uh, Harry does later on. A uh, bit of foreshadowing. Um, so Moses is, is born to a woman. We don't know her name. It never tells us her name. It just says she's a Levite. Um, and she's born, and she's like, okay, I, I've got to try to hide this child until he gets past the age where they're not going to kill him. But she realizes fairly quickly that this just doesn't go work. That's not going to happen. Um, so she's got to find some other way to save her son. Um, so she comes up with this grand plan that I'm going to use the Pharaoh's daughter to do it. Um, I don't know if that was her plan from the start, that she had this grand scheme that she knew how it was going to work, or whether she was just like, I'm going to throw my kid in a basket and see what happens. Um, we don't really know. Um, so she made a basket, and it's a bad, we all know the story, um, puts Moses in it to see what happens. Now, I remember when, when I was a kid, every time they depicted Moses, they depicted the woman coming and put him in the river, and he floats down the river, and, 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 and they get scooped up. It's not, it's not all what happened. Um, the, the, the Nile River, especially near where the populated areas, the shores were very, very shallow. And lots of weeds grew in, in the, the shallow of the water. So it was almost, the, the edges of the river were almost like a swamp. It's not like we think of when we look at a river and there's just things flowing by. No, you've got swamp land all around the edge of the river because the river was very shallow. And so that's what most sister did. He just took him and he just plopped them down in the reeds in one of the shallow parts so it wouldn't move anywhere and just went back to the kid to see what would happen. So most, you know, Pharaoh's uh, daughter comes out, sees him, picks him up, you know, and so again, most the sister, who's, who's in there hiding to see what happens, like, hey, you want me to find a woman to take care of that for you? You know, that, I thought that was kind of ingenious. You know, he says, yes, he says, okay, I'll go find a woman for you. And it's a bummer. You know, <laughs> so it was this great plot that worked out fantastically for them. Um, to, that uh, Moses is now being, being taken care of by a wet nurse that is his own mother, which Pharaoh's daughter doesn't know that, um, until he's old enough to be weaned, and then he goes back to Pharaoh's daughter to be raised. I imagine that had to be a very, very difficult thing for Moses' mother to do. That you have this child that's probably now a year old, somewhere around there. Um, and that you have to give him away. But you have to give him away to make sure he lived. Um, and so he lives in, with the, in the Pharaoh's household, growing up as an Egyptian. Um, until an event happens, which is, this happens right back when he's 40 years old. Uh, so he's been living in the Pharaoh's house for a good, probably 38, 39 years at this point. Um, and he sees an Egyptian being beaten or he sees an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, and he gets angry, and he kills him um, to protect the, the, the Hebrew. And so he he gets found out by another Hebrew. He, so he's like, I've got to do something. And he runs, and he flees. And he flees to, to Midian. Um, now, we're not positive where exactly Midian is. Um, I'm pretty sure it's the other side of the Red Sea and what is now Saudi Arabia. In the northern part of Saudi Arabia. That's just a guess. No one's really positive. Lots of people have spent their entire lives trying to figure out exactly where it is. Nobody really knows, but that's the best guess at this point. I said it was somewhere in, in, in northern Saudi Arabia. And he meets the, these seven women in a well trying to, trying to water their flocks. Now, it, it, it talks about the shepherds that, they're, that, are, that are coming trying to run them off. It's not because the shepherds were mean. It's just there's only so many wells to go around, and they have a flock full of sheep. And so they're going to show up. It's like, I want to run my sheep. I'm a big guy with all my sheep. Your 
for several women, and he just shoves them aside and feeds them. It waters their flock. Eventually, they're going to get to water their, 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 their flocks, but it usually takes a while because they're, they get run off by anybody else who comes up and wants to use the well because the wells are so big. But Moses intervenes, saves them, uh, waters their flock for them, sends them on their way. So that's why when they got back and, and their father was like, why are you back so soon? This is the common thing. This is the everyday thing. They expect to constantly have to fight for that water and constantly lose. And so uh, he's like, why'd you let this guy go? There's this thing. And, and the, the thing we have to think about with me, it doesn't, uh, or with uh, rule, it doesn't say if he has any sons. Um, we don't know. It says he has seven daughters. Um, that's a huge household to have no male children. That, from a societal standpoint, that's not a good thing. That's not a good position to be in. At uh, that time period, to have a whole lot of daughters and no sons, it's not a good position to be in, um, because it's the the, the the society was very male dominated. Uh, women were servants, and uh, men were the leaders, and so to not have male male children to to take care of the family puts all the burden of his family on him. He's probably getting older at this point, um, and so he comes back and he invites the man back and offers his daughter Zipporah. I imagine this was not the hey welcome. I'm assuming it didn't happen like that. It's some time passed. They stayed there for a little bit. But we don't know. Because the, the Bible is very brief on this point. Um, and, and, and so he takes Zipporah as his wife, has a child, and that's where the story ends for today. That is the first 40 years of, of Moses' life. Um, it's very brief. The Bible doesn't talk a whole lot about it. We have to infer a lot about what happens from there. But there's an important thing we, we, we can take from this story. Um, now, I asked you earlier, I said, what's a, a name, a word that you think of when you think of Moses? So, since Stan was trying to find the, the, the bit there, what's your word for Moses? Full rushes. Full rushes, okay. Minus two words, very much. Very much, okay. Ten. Ten, okay. <laughs> you don't have one, it's okay. Flawed. What? Flawed. Flawed, okay. A killer. Okay. Basket. Baby. Baby. Okay. Oh, Sam. Yes, yeah, Sam back there. What? Red Sea. Red Sea. Okay. Okay. Um, only one person said the word I was looking for. Do I? Um, only one person said the word that I was thinking of. That was killer. We all know the story of Moses. We just read the story of Moses, where he murdered an Egyptian. Only one person said killer. Everyone else talked about everything else about his life. So the thing we have to take from this is we are not defined by our past. There are things we do, there are things that happen to us um, that are unavoidable, our circumstances of birth, our, you know, our, our, our past actions. They do not have to define us. They did not define Moses. Moses. Moses went on to do a great many things throughout his life, one of which was murder an Egyptian. But that's not what we think of. That's not where we go when we think of Moses. Moses, and if, if Moses' mother had followed what circumstances dictated, Moses would have been killed as an infant. But she didn't. She defied the circumstances of his birth to help him live. When Moses murdered an Egyptian to save his people, he fled to keep on living and would spend another 80 years of his life doing a great many things for a great many people. He didn't let that event determine the rest of his life. He did not spend the rest of his life, the rest of his life as if he did murder. He spent the rest of his life as a liberator. As a leader, you know, as, as a savior. Uh, when he was born, he didn't just, his mother just didn't let him die. She, she, she found a way to let him live, escaping the circumstances of his birth. Now, most of us uh, have things in our past that we're not happy about. A lot of us have things that have, have circumstances of our childhood that, if left to their own devices, would have gone very, very badly for all of us. But you escape those because you don't let them define you. You don't look at 
none of us looked at our child and says, I can't do that because of this. I can't do that because of this. Every last one of us are here because we believed in ourselves. And we believed in what we could accomplish. And we didn't let our circumstances uh, dictate us. Now, I don't know everybody's life story. And I'm not going to pick on anybody. I'm, I'm, I'm famous for picking on my family. I'm not going to use my family. It's, it's, it's not like, listen, it's not. But uh, a lot, most of you know this, the circumstances of my family's childhood anyway. So um, it, it, it would go without saying um, that if we had just succumbed to what our circumstances were, they would, none of us would ever become what we are. And I've, I've said this before, if you think back to your childhood, what you thought you were going to be as an adult isn't what you are now. Going to bed, it's not. You know, because circumstances change, and we overcome adversity, and we overcome mistakes, and we overcome bad circumstances in order to become the people that we are, because we are not defined by them. Now, this, this was more of a more of a devotion. Again, I'm not going to go back to the trade, but like a, the sermon's three points. This is really only one. So this is devotion. But it's okay. I'll have three sermons over the course of three uh, sermon over the course of three weeks, so, so that'll work. But I just wanted to make one point today from the life of Moses, which is do not let your present circumstances define what you are capable of. Do not let your past mistakes define what you can do. All of us have the capability to rise above that. All of us have the capability to be more than we think we should be. That anyone else thinks we could be. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you today for your forgiveness. For your understanding. For your belief in us. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to go beyond what our, what our capabilities would seem to be. Thank you for your strength and your perseverance and your will to make us more than what we should be. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to end the way we began. Psalm number 337 in our song books. Psalm number 337. On this one, I'm going to ask you to stand because we're going to sing about being glad. And I hope that um, Scott's sermon, uh, Scott's message to us this morning got through. We are not defined by our past. I am a walking example of that. Um, I've shared with most of you a little bit of my history. And um, I say it all the time. Um, our past does not define us. It's something that happened to us, not necessarily who we are. And that is a very good example in the life of Moses. He could have been defined his entire life as a killer and not as a leader and not as someone who was, was allowed the, the honor of standing on holy ground. But he chose not to do that. And he did it in gladness. And so I hope that as we close today that we are also in gladness and that we, um, that we can see who we are meant to be in Christ. So we're going to sing Psalm number 337 uh, one more time. So, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. Made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Glad. He has made me glad, he has made me glad, I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I hope this week that you take the time to find reasons to be glad.